Check, one, two. Check, one, two. This is a test of the microphone broadcast system. Check. Cash or press the button at the bottom of your screen. Check, check. All right, we good, Steve?
Good morning, everyone. I would so love to be able to say it's good to see you here, but of course I can't. So I will just say welcome. Welcome to this time of worship across the physical distance that we need to keep between ourselves now and welcome into this shared space in God's spirit that we can so gratefully enter together. Welcome to all of our Salford family who has gathered in one way or another this morning and welcome also to any of you who have stopped by from other places. It truly is good to be together, even in this way. This morning, there are, I think, nine of us here in the church space. Darwin and Steve and Brad and George are all dealing with the needed technology things, and the other five of us you'll see along the way. And thank you to Rochelle Mose for providing the piano music that you were listening to in the last few minutes. I so much wish to be able to say, how are you at the end of this past week, here at the beginning of the new week, and then to be able to actually hear your response. In lieu of that, I want to read a Facebook post from a friend in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I met Joyce Peachy Lind in the worship course I took at Eastern Mennonite Seminary some years ago and I resonated so much with what she wrote here this week. It's called A Pandemic Lament. And she says before she starts the poem, as we figure out how to live into this new way of being, we need to lament and listen to the children. They are telling us what we need. And Joyce notes that she was given permission to share the exchange that's mentioned here and I received uh, permission from Joyce to share. Pandemic lament. This morning, as I was scrolling through Facebook, absent-mindedly, of course, I read a post by a friend whose four-year-old daughter had melted into tears because she couldn't find some little toys she forgot she had, but is now remembering because she is at home. She needed someone to help her find them but dad needs to work and mom has work too. Both have full-time jobs and other people depend on them. One to keep computers running so that people can be connected in the midst of so much disconnect. And the other to create community for a group of third grade children and make lesson plans and teach them how to learn in a new way. And to be a loving, calm bit of stability in the midst of such instability. Later in the same thread, she added a note to her mom, the little girl's grandma. If you were here, you would definitely not give up on finding the lost toys, as all the rest of us certainly have. Then she added, we really are OK, mom, and included a photo of the little girl after the sobs had subsided. Grandma replied, glad you are OK. Here's a hug and a kiss. Joyce goes on, after reading their exchange, that's when my tears came. My first tears since all this began. My first acknowledgement to myself that this is hard, hard on me, hard on us, hard on everyone. This is so much new and unknown and anxiety all at once. And life has changed is changing and will change. And maybe like this little girl, we are all looking for things we forgot we had that we are remembering because we are at home, but we can't find them, at least not yet. And the people who could help us find them aren't here. And honestly, the rightful response is to melt down into tears to take our sobs to our important people. And instead of doing our schoolwork to settle in and watch Mary Poppins and do finger crocheting, which is what they did, at least for a while. 
The rightful response is to name our losses, to name what is bringing us to tears, to give ourselves and each other permission to sob, to lament, and share those with our family, our community, our important people, whoever they may be, wherever they may be. And when the tears and sobs end, to tell each other, we're still okay. And I'm glad you're okay. Here's a hug and a kiss. And maybe send each other a picture or a video just to make sure. And then tomorrow, we'll get up and try again. And maybe we will find some of those lost things, or maybe we won't. But we can still be connected one way or another. And I would add, connected to each other and to God. If you have your printed order of worship that was sent out, let us read together the call to worship that is printed there. You will notice that it is based on Psalm 23, which our service this morning centers around. The Lord is our shepherd. We have everything we need. The Lord leads us beside peaceful waters and right paths, comforting us through the valleys of despair and preparing for us a rich feast. We have more than we need. The Lord anoints us for healing, strengthening, gifting, and blessing. Our cups overflow with goodness and mercy. We will live in the house of the Lord forever. This is an unusual time. I look out at empty pews and note that how unusual it may be. But I think of us gathering together in our homes and living rooms, and that gives me some comfort, too. This is an unusual time. And we gather together here now with fear and anxiety wherever we may be, not knowing what the weeks ahead will bring. But we do know many things. We know that God is with us no matter what may come. We know that we're not alone as a community of faith. We have each other. The burdens we bear are not ones that we carry alone. So as we join together in worship from wherever you are, we join together as one body, even as we're apart from each other right now. And I think of joining together with the church around the world as well many of whom have known anxiety and fears that we'll never be able to, to understand. But as we join together in worship, we stand together even as we are apart from each other physically. The writer, poet, musician Linford Detweiler shared a piece that he wrote this week where he invites us to breathe and to breathe deep so I invite you from wherever you are to find a position of comfort in your seat and breathe. Breathe deep now. Breathe in and breathe out. And prepare to worship the God who is with us, whatever may come. So listen to these words from Linford Detweiler. Breathe. Go on and live your unexpected life. Inhale love. Exhale surrender. Trust all that's in between. Behold, all things are become new. Really? There's fear, there's shock, there's separation, and there's sadness. On our earth, there always have been and always will be unless until a man of sorrows rides down the dawn on a white horse with the jukebox turned way up, blasting an unexpected song. Hopefully Satchmo himself in charge of blowing the horns, his cheeks bulging, his eyes wide, his lungs healthy. 
but don't hold your breath. Breathe. Go on and live your unexpected life. Behold, we don't know what the future holds. We never did. We never will. How much oxygen is there in inhaled air? All the best priests, pastors, rabbis, and all the best friends learn to leave elbow room for mystery. Never trust anyone who's afraid of saying, as far as I know, breathe. Go on and live your unexpected life. Does your favorite coffee mug still feel good in your hand? Did the tree swallows return limpid in the air? They did here. Are people you love still near? Breathe deep into your lungs while you still can. Even in the best of times, the expiration date remains unknown. Breathe. Go on and live your unexpected life. Inhale love. Exhale surrender. Trust all that's in between. These are unusual times we live in, but we're not alone. We have each other. We know many things. We know that God is with us no matter what may come. We are, know that we are not alone as a community of faith. We have each other. The burdens we bear are not ones we carry alone. Breathe. Breathe. Inhale love. Exhale surrender. And as you join together in this worship, wherever you are, know that you are loved and that God is with us. Thank you so much, Mo's family, for providing us with that music. I'd like to invite the children to prepare for children's time. Well, here I am at the children's time bench, and I'm feeling so cozy. 
I have this blanket here that my mom made, and I have this little bear. This is Mateo's bear, I borrowed it. Put him right there. And I also have this blanket that I wanted to show you. This is my blanket from when I was little. And it has my name on it right here, and it has some animals that my cousins made for me. And it's very faded and worn because I would carry this around with me when I was little. And it gave me comfort. So I'll put it right here and stay wrapped up in this fuzzy blanket here. You might have a comforting blanket or stuffed animal that you like to hold, maybe a bear or something else. And after children's time, I'm going to invite you to go and get it and have it with you for the rest of the service, but not quite yet. Some adults have comforting things as well that, they, that bring them comfort. Have you ever heard of someone talking about a comfort food, maybe a food that brings them comfort that they like to eat, that makes them feel better when they eat it? Or maybe there's an article of clothing that they like that, that's really comfortable to wear. Adults, I wonder if you can think of something that's a comforting item for you too. Later on, we're going to hear a scripture about how God comforts us. And you can use your imagination as you hear it. God comforts us like a warm blanket or a special teddy bear or like lots of other things that the scripture will describe and you can listen for them. Now, I have one more thing to tell you about how God comforts us. I think God can comfort us like a blanket or a stuffed animal. And I also think God can use you and me to comfort each other too. We might comfort each other by giving a hug when somebody is feeling scared or lonely. We might comfort each other by saying, I'm here for you or by sending a letter or an email or calling somebody. Those are some of the ways that God might use you or me to comfort someone. We can show God's comfort to other people too. And in some ways that's even better than a blanket or a stuffed animal. Will you pray with me? Dear loving God, Thank you for using so many different ways to comfort us. Please help us imagine more ways as we listen to the scripture and help us comfort others when they need it too. Amen. Now you can go and get your comforting item and have it with you for the rest of the service. We join together now in, in a time of confession, in a time of prayer. It's an unusual, as, we, as I mentioned earlier, unusual circumstances. So you have unusual circumstances wherever you are now. And we have some opportunity to maybe pray and get comfortable in a way that you wouldn't if you were sitting here in the pews. Maybe you're sitting in your easy chair right now you can lay back, get comfortable. If you're sitting on your couch, put your feet on the ground and your hands on your, on your lap. We'll have just a, a minute of silence that we can be reflective and, and pray together. But I'm picturing all of you in your living rooms and on your couches and maybe with your cats or your dogs curled up next to you and in a different time, but in a place that we can we can embrace a time to confession in a different way and a different kind of comfort too. So join together in these words of prayer as we pray together. God, we confess that we are quick to judge others and not acknowledge our own sins and weaknesses.
We confess that we do not always follow your example because immorality, impurity, and greed are part of our lives. And obscene stories, foolish talk, and coarse jokes come from our lips, God. We need your light to shine on us, to expose the things we say and do that are not pleasing to you. Forgive us our sins. Though your hearts were once filled with darkness, now you are full of the light of the Lord. This light within you produces only what is good and right and true. Let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. Walk in the light, for you are no longer blind.
I will be reading Psalm 23 from the King James Version, and then Aurora Capusta will read from the message. You can learn more about the junior high uh, students and their versions of the message, their copies of the message that they have recently received in the newsletter if you'd like. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. My shepherd, I don't hear thee. You have bed me down in lush meadows. You find me quiet pools to drink from. True to your word, you let me catch my breath and send me in the right direction. Even when the way goes through Death Valley, I am not afraid when you walk by my side. Your trusty shepherd's crooks makes me feel secure. You serve me a six-course dinner right in front of my enemies. You revive my dropping head. My cup brims with blessing. Your beauty and love chases after me every day of my life. I'm back home in the house of God for the rest of my life. The words of the 23rd Psalm are etched in me. I have no memory of learning them. I do not actively rehearse them. I have gone years without reading or reciting them. And yet, in a kind of miracle, in a moment, they are on my lips and my breath, as they may be on yours even now, rising from a place deep in me, a place deeper than me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, and my cup runneth over, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A few weeks ago, I flew to the West Coast for a conference, a feat of mobility that seems brazen in this time of distance, isolation, and quarantine, this time of fear and loneliness, sickness, and death. I took a book with me on this trip, a spiritual memoir by the poet Kathleen Norris. I had read this book before, but I was eager for an afternoon of rereading. I always need a book when I fly, and I prefer one I've been with before. I need familiar words to ground me as we break through clouds into sky. I need familiar words that will surprise me out of my wild imaginings made wilder by speed and altitude. In this book, Kathleen Norris tells of an abandoned faith resurrected in a small South Dakota town and in an ancient monastic liturgy where she learned to read, to recite, to hear, and to know the Psalms deeply beyond time and beyond herself. She writes, the Psalms spoken aloud and left to resonate in the air around me 
push me into new time and space. Here time flows back and forth, in and out of both past and future, and I too am changed. The words spark like a welder's flame. They keep flowing like a current carrying me farther than I had intended to go. I paused when I read this. I couldn't hear them in that bustling plain, but I could feel them, the Psalms. Cast into the air around Norris and now around me, words that spark as they reach out, like a current, to carry us farther than we intended to go. Norris is a much more disciplined speaker of the Psalms than I am. As a Benedictine oblate, she practices a liturgy that recites the Psalms daily that fills the air with these ancient prayers, these poems, these sacred words, these human confessions of despair and proclamations of hope. No psalm, perhaps, has been spoken aloud more often or by more people, both the faithful and the faithless, than Psalm 23. As Norris recounts elsewhere, it is a psalm that is etched onto so many. Over these last several weeks, as I have studied and prayed Psalm 23, preparing for this sermon, which has felt weightier and weightier by the day, I have meditated on the well-known words of this psalm, the shepherd, the green pastures and still waters, the valley of the shadow of death, the table, the oil, the cup. Many more educated and more experienced and dare I say more called speakers than I have preached on these words, teaching the metaphors and images of the psalm with an expertise in ancient Hebrew language, poetry, faith, and culture that I simply do not have. But over these last several days, as we have been cut off from each other, distant from illness, but also from people, urged apart, isolated, the spark of this psalm shifted for me. It shifted out from the words to the people, like Norris, and like me, and maybe like you, who have carried these words with them, parting lips to speak aloud, to call out in the language of the psalmist again and again. I have read about and I have imagined the poet psalmist who first spoke these words, the Hebrew people who carried them from desert to desert, the centuries of mystics and monks, the gilded poets called by King James as biblical translators, the enslaved poets called to sing in the fields of America's plantations, the mothers and grandmothers like mine who I know called out from church pews, on needlepoint wall hangings, and in private prayer, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I have wondered about all of them, the fears and hopes they called out behind these words. Hoping against odds, I spoke with my mother in New Hampshire a few weeks ago and asked her to look at my grandmother's Bible to open it to Psalm 23. I have only a few clear memories of my maternal grandmother. She died when I was eight, when my mother was 36, one year younger than I am now. I recall a, a huge garden, large buckets and shelling peas, radishes loaded with salt on yellow plates painted with golden stalks of wheat, her voice, the scars on her chest after the mastectomy. When she knew she was going to die, she wrote a note to her grandchildren. We each have a copy. It's reprinted on cheap office paper, but it is sacred. It is a short note, only a few lines, but it is clear. Her prayer, one of her last, was not for our happiness or our health. She knew all too well at 55 how fickle both happiness and health can be. She prayed instead for faith, 
that we would seek and know the comfort of the Creator. She prayed, perhaps, out of and for the faith of Psalm 23. I know what I hoped my mother would find, what she would read to me over the phone when she opened that Bible, commentary written in the margins, or a hand-scrawled date off to the side, or words underlined, some sign of my grandmother's voice there in the psalm. But there was none. And so I began to imagine what those words sounded like on her lips, on her breath. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I found another voice that's become part of my imaginings in the poet Catherine Sassanov. She describes the inevitable yet miraculous passing down of this psalm, voice to voice. She writes, It amazes me that as an adult I find myself having the 23rd psalm memorized, start to finish, in its King James entirety, completely, by heart, and without my having ever intended to learn it. Little by little, death by death, wake by wake, from the antique bookmark I found in a secondhand shop, from the back of the laminated obituary marking my mother's passing, on the flyers handed out by silent women in front of the ruins of the World Trade Center. Here Sasanov lingers, returning to the day nearly 20 years ago when the towers fell. The 23rd Psalm is, for Sasanov, tied forever to the people of 9-11. Not the politicians or preachers who wielded the psalm in the wake of that terrible day, but the people caught in the tower's stairwells, some of who survived and others who did not, who spontaneously, instinctively, from somewhere deep, began reciting the psalm aloud and together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Together, they spoke this prayer together, by heart, out of faith, but also, I suspect and I lament, out of fear. Together. The text of Psalm 23 narrates an intimate relationship between an ancient speaker the I who shall not want, and God, the shepherd Lord who becomes by the fourth verse the familiar you or thou. But as this psalm has been passed down, the words picked up and spoken aloud by person after person after person, the singular I has become a collective. When I speak the words, I shall not want, I become one more I in the psalm. One more voice in a current of voices that have spoken these words aloud in times of private and public despair to reach out to God and to each other. Theologian Walter Brueggemann has written nine books on the Psalms, and he writes as both a scholar and a believer who pursues God by praying the Psalms, all of the Psalms aloud. Let me quote him here at some length. He writes, the Psalms, with a few exceptions, are not the voice of God addressing us. They are rather the voice of our own common humanity, gathered over a long period of time. When we turn to the Psalms, it means we enter into the midst of that voice of humanity and decide to take our stand with that voice. We express our solidarity in this anguished, joyous, human pilgrimage. We add a voice to the common elation, the shared grief that besets us all. As I read many of the very human voices of Psalm 23, I hear the common elation, the insistence on hope, on goodness and mercy, 
but I can also hear the grief. The grief is deep. It filled Frederick Douglass's prophetic voice, a former slave, a former fugitive, when he condemned the national chorus made, as he put it, from the chanting of psalms and the clanking of chains. And the grief is fresh. It is recent. It fills the many LGBTQ plus Christians who, like David Popham, have been for so long exiled from the elation of Psalm 23. Speaking for his community of exiled believers, he laments with words that are hard for me to hear. He writes, we encounter this psalm with disdain. For Psalm 23 does not speak to our experience. We have been left wanting. But then, in an act of faith, of miracle, of spark, both Douglas and Popham reach back to the psalm, to the people of the psalm, to the faith of the psalm. We could leave the psalm here, dangling in the midst of our mistrust, Popham says. But we cannot throw this psalm back in the psalmist's face, for the psalmist has also lived through the underbelly of faith, and with a cry of trust proclaimed, even in the valley of the shadow of death, God is with me. We are wanting this morning. We are wanting each other to be together face to face and hand to hand. We are wanting healing. We are wanting justice. We are wanting God to walk among us and in us and through us. We are wanting the shepherd. We are wanting to want no more. Psalm 23 is etched in me. But if I am honest, if I can confess, on most days the words of the psalm seem, to borrow the words of Langston Hughes, to be a dream deferred. For we, the human we, are left wanting. And yet, the words of the psalm are etched in me, and in a kind of miracle, in a moment, they are on my lips and my breath, rising from a place deep in me, a place deeper than me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What am I doing when I speak these words aloud? I am praying, I am in the words of Brueggemann, committing an act of hope. As Brueggemann writes, Psalm 23, like so many of the Psalms, does not describe what is. It evokes into being what does not exist until it has been spoken. When we speak the Psalm, we are calling into being a world that does not yet exist, a world rich with more justice, more mercy, more goodness than the one we live in. When we speak the psalm, we are calling into being a faith that may not exist. When we speak the psalm, we are joining together with those before us and those after us, and we are speaking for liberation from the valleys. We are calling out, claiming that even in the darkness, there is one to address. There is one who hears. And so we raise our voices, joining the many who have called out and prayed the 23rd Psalm as a song of radical hope. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. My cup runneth over. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May it be so.
Again, if you have the printed order of worship nearby, please refer to that as we move into our time of prayer. I will not be naming individuals' names here, but please hold these dear ones of our church family in your hearts and in your prayers this week and this morning as we pray together. And though we will not hear each other's voices, let us keep our practice. When I pray in your mercy, please continue with, Lord, hear our prayer. I will leave spaces throughout for you to name audibly or silently the concerns closest to your heart at this time. And I want to acknowledge that I am using a prayer from the Lent section of the Anabaptist prayer book to structure our prayer this morning. Let us pray. Oh, forgot the book. Now let us pray. The Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. Sheltering God, we pour out our hearts before you because you are a refuge for us. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You lead us with your light and truth. We pray for ourselves and those dear to us. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You provide for the poor and the stranger we pray for our community and for our neighbors. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. You are the help and hope of your people. We pray for the church in all places, for believers throughout the world, that we may be one. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. All the nations belong to you, all the people of the world, and we pray now for the world that your healing and your reign may come and your will be done on earth. In your mercy, Lord, Hear our prayer. We lift up to you, O oh God, this morning in a special way those who are in the front lines of service during this pandemic, medical personnel, grocery workers, other workers in essential services, and all who are especially vulnerable to this illness. In your mercy, Lord, Hear our prayer. We lift up to you those who are in the midst of medical treatment or anticipating surgery this week. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We lift up to you families of all ages who are adjusting to more time at home we pray for patience to abound between members, for the tasks of each day to go smoothly, for creativity and kindness to flow. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. 
We pray too for those who are coping with isolation at this time of social distancing, for loneliness to be kept at bay and relationships to be sustained in new ways. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are serving as caregivers in their immediate or extended families, for strength to carry on, for patience and the availability of resources, both inner and outer, for the wisdom and ways to find rest and nourishment for themselves. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for Salford Mennonite Child Care Center during this difficult and challenging time, that the ministry team and the administration will have clarity in making important decisions that will protect all children, families, teachers, and staff while keeping this small nonprofit ministry sustainable. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And along with all congregations in Eastern District and Franconia Conference, we pray for Ambler Mennonite Church, for new co-pastors Michelle and Jacob Curtis, and the church as they begin their journey in mutual ministry for wisdom and insight as they discern a collective vision and move through generational change. In your mercy, Lord, hear our prayer. And so we offer the concerns we carry in our heart. Hungry Christ, your body is broken in the rocky soil of human suffering. Lovingly tend and till us that we may at this day's end entrust ourselves into the hands of the merciful one, praying as you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. As we come to the close, near to the close of our service today, we have some guest musicians, though they will be here virtually instead of in person. The Walking Roots Band has been to Salford a number of times in person over the years, sometimes as a full band, sometimes just Greg and Seth leading our children. Last Sunday, they had planned to practice, to get ready to head into the studio shortly to begin work on a new album. But instead of heading there, they elected to connect virtually while physically distancing in the hope that together we can all still flatten the curve. They write, these are strange days, friends, but we choose to live in hope, not fear. Let's get creative, keep our distance physically, stay connected all the other ways, avoid crowds, wash our hands, practice Sabbath, make each other laugh over the phone, be kind, and rest assured that we are not forgotten. Rest assured he's not forgotten. Rest assured. Oh. 
shore. Here it comes, that empty feeling. It's got, got you believing. You're all alone. There's something telling you that you won't make it. You just can't shake it. And you feel you can't go on. Rest assured, he's not forgotten. Rest assured, he'll take care of you. Look at the times he's been there before. He'll be there again, rest assured. You've been praying and believing. But you're not receiving, seems hope is gone. You're feeling like you just can't go on anymore. But that's what faith is for, so keep on holding on. Rest assured, he's not forgotten. Rest assured, he'll take care of you. Look at the time. It's time to leave this place. And as we take our leave, I invite those of you particularly who are Salford members to think about who on a usual Sunday you would be likely to talk with. And if you have not made connection with some of those people this week, let this be an invitation for you to think about how you might do that in the days ahead. And now receive this benediction. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness and protect you through the storm. May he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you. May he bring you home rejoicing once again, eventually, into our door. Amen. Blessings, all of you, dear ones. Take care. Be well. Let us know how you're doing. Peace be with you this week. Amen. <laughs>